Um, welcome back. As we are we are uh, into week four. We're we halfway done after tonight on this winding journey that we're taking through fostering resilience, building empathy, and strengthening attachments. Um, there, come on in. So tonight, what we're going to look at is uh, really kind of the heart and soul behind this entire series of trainings that we're doing. Um, we've covered a lot about kind of getting to know yourself so far. You guys enjoyed that? Think about your own attachment styles, your own history, kind of what you bring to the equation as a parent in this, this parenting relationship. Then we've we talked kind of about, about the brain anatomy. Anyone thinking about flipped lids lately? Thinking about your, your different states that you go to, recognizing the, the upstairs thinking where I'm clear and I'm focused and I've got a good idea of what's going on I want to learn versus the, the downstairs brain where we're really, uh, we're feeling it, feeling the emotions, kind of our attachments, our connections, our feelings all living down there. Then our downstairs brain, our, our reactive state, that fight or flight sort of state. And you'll notice that information kind of flowing through all the rest of the week. So if you've felt a little overwhelmed by some of the science part and some of the brain anatomy and those sorts of things, that's, that's okay. We're, we're going to continue to work that out. And as you saw last week, you kind of see how knowing a little bit about the brain kind of helps you understand what's going on as your child's developing. And you can understand what, what they're capable of doing um, versus what's a little bit beyond their reach at the moment. And also learning that... Um, you know, like our, our teenagers that have really, really hot limbic systems and their, their feeling brains are really, really powerful and they're not quite caught up with their upstairs brain yet. They're still under construction, developing. So we can recognize when our kids go to really big feelings really, really quickly, some of that may have to do with, with uh, brain development. So as we're becoming those insightful parents who are thinking about ourselves, we're thinking about our kids, we're using insight to know the world inside ourselves, we're using empathy to know the world inside our child. Uh, we've, we've learned the development piece, but our next piece of curiosity that we're really going to dig into is, is the idea of what happens with trauma. A lot of you live this day in, day out. Um, so a lot of this will feel like review for a lot of you. Um, what it might also do is, is kind of put some words and some, some statistics and some research behind the things that you see. So you know, a lot of times you'll talk with people about trauma and you'll talk to them about what your kids have experienced. And it, and it feels like you know, it's, it's your own personal story and it's like, well, does this, is this really real? Does this really impact people that much? Um, by the end of tonight, you'll be able to see some of the best research that's been done in, in the, the world of, of trauma and understanding kind of what it really does, the health impacts, the mental health impacts, the physical health impacts all across the lifespan, and why it is really, really important to pay attention to trauma. Uh, you, you'll also see, uh, as we, we really explore the ACEs study, just how prevalent trauma is in our culture. So it's not just those few people, it's like a good chunk of our population that this relates to. So you'll have kind of some numbers in your head about that and, and be able to tell and, and hopefully you'll be able to talk to other people. I love being able to, to throw out the ACEs study and, and say, you know, there was this pretty significant body of research that was done that explains a lot of this and there's a lot of facts that we can share. You can go right to the ACEs website and see so much of this. And we'll also start looking at so the, the what next part. What do we do with, with this trauma? And we've looked at a few things. We've looked at the name it to tame it, the being able to, to put words and labels on, on emotions that are happening for kids so that they're able to have a little bit more sense of control, access that thinking brain, and work through those feelings a little better. The connect and redirect. Anyone tried that one out yet? Connect with the feeling before you go straight to your left brain explanation, your logic, and your consequences. So um, we will see, and engage, don't enrage was the other one we talked about last week. When you notice a flipped lid, um, don't go straight to the nuclear option with the kid and throwing out consequences and throwing out some of these big things that that feeling brain can't quite process in the moment. We got to engage first. We got to get on the level and connect with what's going on help them get back 
their access to their green brain, to their thinking brain, so that they can actually process what we're trying to teach them, what we're trying to communicate and help, and help them through. Um, so we'll, we'll see tonight a few more things to really start thinking about in terms of connection and empowering our kids and doing those corrective moments too when we have to step in and do some correcting. Uh, we'll, we'll see a little bit more about what to do. So hopefully by the end of tonight, you will be even more of a trauma expert than you are right now. And you'll be able to cite some research and talk about what this really does in the brain and body and also have a few more ideas of what we can do with our kids uh, to reduce the impact of the trauma. We can't change trauma that's in the past. Remember, that's the roots on the tree, like we talked about in week one. We can't go in there and take those roots out. But what we can do is maybe add some new roots. You know, we can add some, some new experiences for our kids to draw from that will hopefully um, help them with some, some new behavior, some new ways of dealing with, coping with life after trauma. And honestly, if we do a great job with, with our kids who have experienced trauma now, we are greatly reducing the likelihood of perpetuating trauma in the future. This is a lot about prevention. The more education we have now, the more insightful we are now, the more we can engage with our kids, reduce the effects of trauma, the more and more likely that, that we, can, we can cease this in, into the next generation. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start our, our parent parent mindfulness moment. We're going to do some relational mindfulness tonight. So what this means is we're going to, we're going to partner up. So Kelly, you want to come on up? We'll show them kind of how we're going to do this tonight. So this is, um, this is something you can do with your kids or with your partner or with your friends or whoever you, you check in with about how you're feeling. Um, and the idea is it's not just, I'm not just going to check in and say, hey, Kelly, how are you doing? We're going to do some relational mindfulness. You're going to see how I'm doing and how, how Kelly's doing, and what we're going to notice is that sometimes we feel the same, and sometimes we, we feel different. So, so how this works, um, I, we're, we're going to use pinkies tonight. Some people do thumbs up, thumbs down, um, but sometimes thumbs down even can be a little, little triggering for some folks, so we're just, we're going to use pinkies tonight. Um, so, so we're going to do, this is pinkies up, everyone practice this with me. This is pinkies out, and this is pinkies down. So if I'm, if I'm checking in with Kelly right now and I say, okay, Kelly, on the count of three, we're going to do a pinky check-in. Okay. And if you feel really comfortable being in front of this whole group of people tonight, <laughs> we're going to go pinkies up. If you're like, yeah, it's okay. I mean, I'm, I'm fine with them being here. Not, not a huge deal. Um, but it's not my favorite thing. I'm kind of in the middle. We'll do pinkies out. Mm -hmm. And if you're like, get me out of here. Corey, why did you ask me to come up here? We're going to do pinkies down. All right? Ready, Kelly? One, two, three. Oh, look at that. Yeah. So I'm noticing, Kelly, we're, we're in the same space right now. We're both feeling pretty comfortable. We're feeling kind of all right. What yeah. do you notice? Well, I noticed that I was thinking, like, what's he going to do? Oh, so you noticed. Like, well, yeah. yeah, and then I thought, well, I'm supposed to do what I'm supposed to do. So I can okay. see there was, you know, but it feels great when you look across the, you know, Sure. The other person and they're up too. Look, look at that. So we had a similar feeling yep. and you had a thought that you can connect with that feeling. Yep. That, so that's how it works. It's not just a check-in. We want to do kind of a, what does that mean to you when we're the same? Or what does it mean to you when we're different? So everybody partner up. Can I face, face someone close to you? If you really don't want to partner up, you don't have to. You can do it with me right here as I'm doing this with our folks out in our rural sites and our, and our people at home. So the, the first question we're going to do is just to, we're going to do like an energy check-in. How energetic do you feel right now? If you're feeling like, woohoo, I'm here, I'm feeling really super energetic, pinkies up. If you're like, I, I made it. <laughs> I'm here. That's, I'm, I'm, that's about all I can be. Or if you're like, man, I'm just, I'm not even really here. We'll do pinkies down. Ready? So everyone face, face your partner. One, two, three, go. <laughs> so, good. so do a little conversation. What do you notice? <laughs> Okay, next one. So this one you're really gonna you're gonna have to think about a little bit more. 
This is a, a kind of a, not an energy check-in, but a mental check-in. This is, how focused are you on this activity right here and now? So you're going to have to really do a check-in. I'm going to do this one really quickly. It, it's, I'm thinking about something else. I'm not here. Or I'm, I'm kind of here, kind of not here. Or I'm totally in this right now. Right? So I'm thinking about something else. I'm kind of here. Or I'm, I'm totally here. Ready? One, two, three. Nice. Good. Good. Oh. Someone's laughing at me. <laughs> okay, great. What, what did you guys notice with that activity? Anyone? You had to think harder mm -hmm. because up is the opposite of what you would normally sure. think. Yeah. yeah. So we kind of threw you a curveball. You had to really think about it. Anyone else notice anything? The pinkies do feel better than the thumbs. Pinkies feel better than thumbs. Okay. And some will find that. This is a great way to check in with your kid. Does this feel better? You know? And you can even do a pinky check-in about a pinky check-in, right? <laughs> we're going to do, hey, we're in pinkies all together. We're like, yeah, I could do either one or get me out of here. I want thumbs now, right? <laughs> so then you can, you can kind of alter the activity. Check in with your kids. None of this stuff is cookie cutter, ever. Someone in, in Junction City had a great question about the, the eye contact, the kind eyes. And they were talking even about that might drive my kid nuts. Or I don't tend to do that and my kids respond. Well, it's ch checking in. This mindfulness piece is a way to really check in with your kids and see what is working for them and what's not. So doing a check in. Hey, I, you know, even that. I'm trying to give you kind eyes right now. Just, you feeling good about that? You don't even notice? Or stop looking at me, mom. <laughs> right? You could do, do that check in with that. So very good. All right. To start off with a challenge for tonight, I want to challenge your, your thinking a little bit. Um, so everything we're talking about tonight is, is going to relate to trauma. And what I want to offer you is, is kind of this, this uh, counselor trick, this kind of cognitive shift that we do of looking at the same problem, but through a different lens. This is called reframing. So we're going to reframe kind of everything that we're, we're talking about, and we're going to use some language to do that. Um, this, this comes from kind of Bruce Perry is, is probably about the world's expert on trauma, specifically childhood trauma. Um, one of his uh, really good books that's just like a lot of stories of him working with people who've experienced trauma is called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. It's a, it's a great book. Uh, Born to Love is another one. You can go on the TIPS website, and there's a little button you can push on books, resources, and it'll take you to his whole page on Amazon. There's lots of great stuff that you could look at. But Dr. Bruce Perry is, is fabulous, and he, he's the one that, that uh, I first started heard, hearing this, this language shift with. He says, um, instead of thinking, when you're interacting with the kid, instead of thinking what's wrong with you, try what happened to you. This is tough all of the time, but, but especially if our, our children are, are shouting at us or acting in these really disrespectful ways or just kind of not getting it, having a really, really hard day. It's really easy for us to go to that what's, what's wrong with you way of, of dealing with things. Shifting our language, shifting our thinking. Instead of what's wrong with you, just try what happened to you. This, this speaks to the trauma. This speaks to what's, what's going on in the kid's life and that there's, there's a deeper reason possibly for, for what's going on. Um, if this sounds interesting to you, I, would, I want to point you to, there was a, a, a 60 Minutes interview with Dr. Bruce Perry that Oprah Winfrey did. Uh, check it out. It is fabulous. Um, there, there's a little wrap-up interview that's, that's on the TIPS website with her talking about her interactions with Bruce Perry. Her words were, after, after spending some time with him and interviewing him about trauma, she said it was probably the most impactful interview she's ever done in her life, which is saying a lot. She's done, she's done a lot of interviews, but she, start, she talked about that idea of looking at the world through the lens of what happened to you versus what's wrong with you. And this is something she said that she wants to use with her, her staff and the people that she works with and the people at her girls' school and all of these things. It just it really changes how, how you view things. So it's a good idea. So we're going we're gonna to look a little bit more at development here. We're going to take from last week 
some of the brain development piece, and we're actually going to look at how trauma impacts brain development from the very first moments of life. So, so watch this video and uh, see what happens. See what happens when, when connection is missing. There is a biological need for relationship. And when relationship does not happen due to trauma, due to abuse, due to neglect, if there's a, a missing component in that relationship, some things start to happen in the brain. Everyone in a community has a vested interest in everyone else's children because everyone else's children determine the next adult population that makes for a successful society. Built into our biology is the need to have responsive interactions with adults. Neglect for children is when they don't get what the brain is expecting to get, what the child is expecting to get, what we are biologically prepared and waiting for, which is input from those around us. It's this back and forth serve and return interaction that literally shapes the architecture of the brain. Serve and return begins when a child looks at something or observe something, makes an utterance, and that represents the serve. And the return is when the parent notices the child doing these things and responds to the child. Under conditions where serve and return is broken, you literally are pulling away the what is the essential ingredient of the development of human brain architecture. It was a really compelling series of experiments where they started by videotaping the mother and the baby engaging in cooing and smiling. And then they asked the mother to basically put on a blank face and not respond at all. When a baby is not attended to, that is a sign of danger to the baby biologically. So the stress systems become activated. In a brain that is constantly bathed in stress hormones, not this up and down that comes with normal development, certain key synapses, the connections between nerves, fail to form and critical regions of the brain. So neglect both fails to provide the stimulation that's needed to develop the basic architecture, and when it's at a certain level, is one of the most potent activators of the stress biology of a young child. So you get a double whammy. Science points to four categories of this spectrum of neglect. The first category would be what's called occasional inattention, where children experience responsiveness most of the time, but occasionally adults don't respond. There's no harm in that, and in fact, there's probably some benefit. A child can learn to self-soothe and explore the environment, and all of those opportunities build brain architecture. The second category, scientists would call chronic understimulation, is where on a regular basis, children have less interaction with the adults around them than is needed for healthy development. Those children typically, when provided with enriched learning opportunities and more typical levels of serve and return, will show catch up. The third category is what science would call severe neglect in a family where not only are there prolonged periods of inattention um, and lack of responsiveness, but often also associated with not being fed enough, not being bathed enough, not having basic needs met. Neglect is a huge problem in the U.S children are much more likely to be neglected than they are to experience any other kind of maltreatment. We see the child really being at risk for much more substantial kinds of deficits down the road that don't necessarily get easily fixed or ameliorated. This is where we really need to think about more complicated and often more intensive strategies to help undo those effects. The fourth category, called severe neglect, generally found in institutional settings, is the result of children living in kind of warehoused type situation in orphanages. 
And it doesn't have to even be as extreme as orphanages. It can be experiences that are regretfully occurring in many, many parts of our country. Often institutional care in this country is under the euphemistic name of transitional care or temporary care or assessment facilities. If you think about what institutional or residential care would look like for an infant, where there's somebody new coming onto the shift every eight hours, it really alters the development of the child's brain architecture and other aspects of the child's development. We have the potential to change children's developmental trajectories. Interventions can apply to parents, to foster parents or adoptive parents, child care settings, Head Start settings, and other kinds of settings. And really, what they're about is attuning people to the serve and return process. Neglecting young children is neglecting the foundations of, of a healthy next generation. The community pays a huge price later in terms of the problems of the next generation, whether it be educational achievement, economic productivity, good citizenship, the ability to parent the next generation. All of the things that have to do with a healthy, prosperous society. So with a lot of the talk around trauma, especially what we're going to look at tonight, it's, it's a bad news, good news situation here. Um, and you don't get to the good news until you take a good look at the bad news. The bad news is this stuff matters and it really impacts our kiddos. The good news is, as I hope you saw in, the, in that video, uh, having a good understanding of what happened to you and that this is, this is most likely due to the impacts of, of trauma or neglect. Um, it gives you the, the ability and the empathy to be able to connect with a child and give them what they need that is restorative, that is healing. It's, it's relationship that causes these, these impacts on the brain and it's relationship that is healing to those wounds. Having a good understanding of, of what's going on will, will really help. Doc, Dr. Ross Green, who wrote the book about collaborative problem solving, has this great phrase. He says, your explanation guides your intervention, which means how you explain a behavior will guide how you, how you move to intervene with that behavior. If your explanation is, they're just a no good kid, or even your explanation is just, I'm not a good enough parent, then your, your interventions will follow those those lines of thinking but if your explanation is aha my kiddo missed something here they need more serve and return they need more connection they need a rehabilitative relationship with me that's gonna that's gonna guide your intervention to to be there for for that kiddo so think about back to our, our upstairs downstairs basement left and right model when the brain is working its best under optimal conditions, um, kids will have all of those parts working together in harmony. Disintegration, remember, is the opposite of that. It's the brain, it stops talking to itself. When trauma of any kind hits the brain, remember, it knocks off that whole upstairs level of thinking, leaving us with what? Right, that leaves us with emotions, and fight or flight to solve most of life's problems. If, if uh, at any point during a child's development, trauma was kind of trumping traditional development, um, they may get stuck at certain phases of development because the, the trauma keeps it down there. You know, they, they, they lack the ability to make sense of what's happening, to make a coherent story about what's happening because their upstairs brain is, is knocked offline. When they're experiencing trauma, what happens is it overwhelms the upstairs brain because trauma is not logical. You know, when you're supposed to be going to that person who is supposed to care for you and you get either nothing or you get pain that doesn't make, make logical sense. And, and when you're experiencing relational trauma, trauma at the hands of someone that you care about the most, 
And when you experience these, these horrific t types of trauma, it so overwhelms the upstairs brain that it, it sends you down to that limbic region or even the brain stem to make sense of what's going on. It's almost like the upstairs says, this is too much for me to handle. I'm checked out. I'm done. We're done trying to make rational sense of this. So it goes down to, to images, feelings, and even down to, to sensation. You know, Basil van der Kolk, who, who literally wrote the definition for post-traumatic stress disorder, wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score, where he describes how trauma becomes lodged in the body. You know, it has all kinds of, of health impacts on you, and, and that idea that if we can't make sense of it up here, it's either going to get stuck in those, those images, or feelings, or, or sensations. So, Dr. Bruce Perry said, okay, okay we, we need to make some sense of this. And when we're looking at a therapeutic model for working with kids who've experienced trauma, uh, this is what he came with, up with. This is called the Neurosequential Model of Healing uh, from the Child Trauma Academy. And, and what he says is that, you know, at whatever point the child experiences trauma, wherever they are, wherever their brain is developing, there may be some, some parts of them that get stuck down there. So the trauma impacts brain development. Remember, brains develop from the bottom up. The last part to develop is that frontal cortex. And even typically functioning people doesn't fully form till age you know, 25 or so, mid-20s. Um, but he said, you know, it, it, the trauma will impact development. And, and the behaviors that follow may mirror where they are in their, in their brain. So if certain skills are not present and interventions don't seem to work with your child, we may need to, to move down in the brain, move down to a lower area of focus. So what that means is if you know, we're seeing some really emotional, explosive behaviors in our kids and we're trying to intervene from an upstairs perspective, we're trying to pour logic on that. We're trying to lecture. We're trying to use lots of words and reasoning, even consequences and rules and structure. If, if they're not up to that level of development yet, we might need to move down. We might need to intervene on a more emotional sort of level. Or if it's actually down in a sensory level, if their functioning is more kind of sensory, it's, it's like fight or flight. It's like moving zero to 60 and nothing flat uh, because they're so triggered. They're, they're trying to intervene in their situation, the stresses that they experience down on the brainstem level. So you may have to intervene at a brainstem level. You may have to give safety, calm. You might have to do sensory types of interventions, some low, slow, rhythmic talking, some pats on the back, that kind of think about like heartbeat sort of things, slow breathing, um, just, just intervening on that brainstem level. So, um, so this is kind of something to think about. It's like, where, where, where are your kids? Where are they? And what the, the behaviors that you find most challenging, what part of the brain do they model the most? Are they more of an upstairs? Or are they like, you know, they got all the way up to here and then trauma hit and a lot of their, their behaviors are kind of like these arguments or logic or words and they're, and they're maybe a little bit too developed in that upstairs area? Or are they more just kind of shut down and emotional? Or are they just sensory, fight or flight, keep me safe? What I'd like for you to do is, is uh, kind of dig in on this with, with your kids. So I want you to get in your groups of two or four and kind of start doing a little bit of assessment here on, on your child. Think about this neurosequential model of healing. Think about your, your kids' behaviors. What you're seeing right now, do they most represent upstairs thinking, downstairs thinking, or basement level thinking? So what, what's going on? And also think about if you know kind of what period of life they might have experienced trauma, is there some connection to, to what, what might be happening with them right now. So, um, so think about what, what behavioral and emotional needs present themselves through your child's behavior right now. And the second thing is, um, can you prioritize meeting those needs? Are there some ways you could meet downstairs brain needs or, or basement level needs? What are some things you could do to kind of reassure whatever, whatever part of the brain might be most activating? Matt, a, a question? Would you ever see, depending on the situation, if it was, it might 
um, respond in certain areas of the basement brain, but then other areas at the upper brain? Uh, Could it be? Okay, so the question is, is there sometimes um, where they might jump around a little bit? And y yes, I would say absolutely that that could, that could happen. And so it, it can be a little slippery sometimes. Um, but the, the main idea is if, if my intervention doesn't seem to be working, do I need to move it down a notch? You know, if I'm trying a lot of, of these kind of like very cognitive sorts of uh, rewards or consequences with my kid, they're just not, it's not, not clicking maybe we need to go down to that emotional connection level or, or the safety level. So take a few minutes, and I'll, I'm going to put that other slide back up so if, if you need to see, see that. But, um, so with, with basement, is it sensory needs? Are they overstimulated? Sights and sounds overwhelm? Physical needs, tendency towards automatic behaviors. Is that what you're seeing with your kiddo? Or uh, the, the downstairs, the limbic, are there emotional needs? Are they feeling overwhelmed? Feelings overwhelm them. Um, attachment needs, easily insulted, provoked, um, or difficult to regulate emotions. Or the cortex, is it more about thinking? They want answers, they want to learn, they want to put things together. Uh, logical arguments with lots of words. What's going on for, for your kiddo? So take, take a minute and discuss this and we'll, we'll be right back. Boy, I love, I love seeing you guys chat. This is like my favorite part of the night. <laughs> what, what do we notice? Anyone, anyone have any uh, like big insight that you just noticed right now or does this bring up any more questions? Yes. Well, we were talking about, um, we were talking about Corey, uh, thank you, mm -hmm. um, about, um, when there's those problematic behaviors or when you're in your downstairs or basement or even the upstairs confusions. Mm -hmm. the, another technique that I learned from uh, your classes was the ACT mm -hmm. or ACT. Yes. And that really helps to uh, divert a problematic situation into a positive direction. Sure. Mm -hmm. That's that acknowledge their intent. This is what I see you, what you would like to do. Communicate a limit. Here's our limit in our household and target the, the, the alternative. What else could we do instead? Absolutely. And we'll, in a few more weeks, we're going to get all over that. So yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. But ha having a plan, having a go-to, something besides just winging it is, is a great idea. You know, it, do I have, even just going in, into your head of like, okay, this is sensory right now. Like I, I can pull myself into sensory dad or sensory mom mode and, and kind of meet them where they are right now. Or wow, they're really wanting some answers. They really want to talk, and, and I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm going to, I'm going to meet that need of that upstairs green brain and be able to do that. Um, I, Kelly and I were talking, as, as you were all talking, about how um, well, you've, you've gone through my stuff a lot and how it's like it's, it's this, it takes a while to sink in. And I was telling her that I, I found my notes of when I, I went to one of Tina Payne Bryson's trainings years and years ago. And I pulled my notes out again this week and I was like, oh my goodness, I really didn't get it back then. And, it take, and I'm just now learning some of the stuff. So, so it's okay if it's feeling a little bit like I'm not exactly sure. It starts to fall into place. And getting just some of the basics of knowing my kids need different things at different times. What's going on with their behavior? Is that communicating something that they might be needing right now? And even just having that, that explanation of trauma may have them stuck at one of these places. They may be really, really stuck. And yeah, they, they do move around sometimes. And sometimes it's not always one thing, so being able to adapt what, what they need. Okay, ACEs study. Who would just show a hands? Who's heard of the ACEs study? Awesome, fabulous, more than most. You guys must be a lot of foster parents. You've done this stuff before. Um, so if you've, if you've heard this before, um, this, some of this again will be review if you haven't. Uh, this is a great thing to know about. It's, it's getting a lot more traction. A lot more people are hearing about it. Um, I've got a video I'm going to show you that kind of gives you an overview of, of what the ACE study was and, and why it matters. This was a landmark study, it was huge. It's one of the biggest uh, studies that's been done in terms of like the amount of people that were researched. Really high number of people were, were studied through the course of this. And we'll, we'll kind of see, see what, uh, what they have to say about it here.
What does your parents' divorce have to do with your risk for heart disease? If your mother had a drinking problem when you were growing up, are you more likely to suffer from depression as an adult? Here's what you should know about ACEs. ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences, extremely stressful events that can happen to a child growing up. Some experiences are so stressful that they can alter brain development, as well as the immune system, increasing the risk of lifelong health and social problems in adulthood. The term comes from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, landmark research that shed new light on the root cause of everything from stroke and liver disease to substance abuse and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up. Anda and Felitti tallied up 10 different kinds of adversity in this largely middle-class and college-educated population. They were stunned to see how common ACEs were. 21% of all respondents were sexually abused as children. 19% grew up with someone who suffered mental illness. 28% had been physically abused. And two out of three respondents had experienced at least one ACE. The researchers next looked at how someone's ACE score, or the number of adversities they experienced, related to a wide array of serious health and social problems. They saw that the more ACEs someone had, the greater their risk for poor outcomes compared with someone with no ACEs. Someone with an ACE score of four had twice the risk of heart disease and cancer. Someone with an ACE score of five had an eight times greater chance of being an alcoholic. And those with an ACE score of six or more, on average, died 20 years earlier. With every major problem they looked at in the ACE study, the risk went up for each additional adverse experience in childhood. As Dr. Robert Anda says, what's predictable is preventable. It's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. ACEs are a tool for understanding the health of a population as a whole. For individuals, an ACE score can be a tool for understanding their own risk for health and social problems and empower them to make changes for themselves and their children. ACEs tend to get passed down from generation to generation and are common across all income levels, races, and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co. Again, kind of bad news, good news, right? Bad news is, is a lot of this stuff has happened. A lot of roots on a lot of people's trees. Good news is, awareness 
is so important. It's so crucial that we, we take a look at this and understand that this, yeah, this stuff exists. These problems happen. And then the prevention side, this is what gets me really excited. Even just a whole another room full of people here and in four other locations that can talk knowledgeably about the ACES study and say, yes, these things happen and they impact everything. Having good knowledge about your own ACEs is really important to be able to take care of yourself and realize, man, I've got a pretty high ACEs score. I might need to be a little careful with my risk factors and I might need to, to get in good community and take care of my health and take care of these sorts of things. Uh, but also seeing culture starting to shift around this and doctors getting a little bit more comfortable and counselors getting more comfortable talking about these things and schools getting more comfortable talking about these things. Uh, there, there's on page 33 in your notebook, I, I found there's a, a really fabulous story about a school in, in uh, Walla Walla, Washington that implemented kind of an ACEs informed, trauma informed behavior program in their school. And you'll, you'll see that the, the statistics there are just awesome, seeing uh, once the policy changed to address behaviors uh, according to trauma informed uh, styles of, of discipline. Um, Everything changed. Referrals to the office, um, incidences requiring police, and this is amazing. Numbers of students who are, who are out of school. It, all of that changed just by addressing some of these, these things around, around trauma and around our ACEs score. So you th think about it. You probably looked, looked as, as we were going through and saw, you know, what, what were those factors for yourself? Your ACE score is how many of these you experienced out of 10 growing up before age 18? Physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, um, physical neglect, emotional neglect, um, mental illness in the household, uh, a parent that went to jail, domestic violence in the household, substance abuse, and, and divorce. So you, know, you can probably figure out pretty quickly kind of what, what your ACE score is just by looking at that. And, and think about the kiddos in your household. What, you know, what, what their ACE score might be. So just quickly again, just the, the highlights there, um, the, this, the numbers are really just pretty, pretty staggering around uh, abuse, neglect, and, and household dysfunction. How many of those were, were present for, for the folks in the study? And this is pretty generalizable. Um, so mm -hmm. do they count like Single parent families and stuff like that, because like, I barely even know anyone that got married before they had oh. kids. So is that being? Like, where, where? No, I'm not sure. I'd have to check. I, th this looks like I think this when they experienced a divorce that that would that would be considered. But but maybe yeah, if there was divorce in your family, that probably um, no with, it could could that could be also yeah. I'll check into that and see. They actually do have definitions for each one of them as part of the questionnaire. Um, and this broke it down by, by men and by women also, and I thought some of these things were really staggering. Even, even looking at the sexual abuse, so like 24% of females, that's like a quarter, one in four, according to this study. Um, and this was, this was back in, in the 90s when this was being reported. Um, and but even, even males, you know, it's 16%, but overall one in five experience sexual abuse, even more than that physical abuse, up to nearly a, you know, a third of the population experience those, those sorts of things. And that the majority of the people have at least one or more ACE. So if you, haven't, if you have an ACE score of zero, more than likely the people on either side of you both have at least one ACE. Right. So they mentioned a lot of the, the things that are, are connected with just, and again, it's not like saying that because these happened, it made these things happen, but it's just an association. They saw when these were present, um, these were, were things that, that were also present for, for people who had ACEs. So it's a lot of mental health, but also addiction, physical health, heart disease, liver disease, all, all of these sorts of things. I pulled out a few of the graphs from, from the video that they just showed also that, that talk about some of the specifics, so like alcoholism, 
um, from zero up to four, you see the jump that happens there. So the more trauma that you've experienced, the, the much greater risk there is for alcoholism. This one is extremely telling. So this is antidepressant prescriptions. And if you'll notice, five or more, it's like peaking out like 100% of the people that were, that were surveyed in this that have an a, had an A score of five or more have been prescribed antidepressants at, at some point. Um, but it, you see it jumps pretty quickly. Smoke, uh, smoking, that, that's pretty sharp rise there. Uh, suicide risk, notice the jump there. Even between one and, and four, there's a, a, a very, very steep jump that's there. And this is the one that, that really you know, breaks my heart, life expectancy for people with an A score of six or more is reduced by 20 years, 20 years of life due to trauma. So well, that's the bad news part. The good news, <laughs> prevention, what do we do? Knowing about this is so helpful, it's crucial. Um, so a um, few things about just, just being aware of ACEs and, and knowing about them. When, when they first started rolling this out, so um, the, Dr. Felitti was, was saying, okay, we're gonna get all the doctors for people who are treated under Kaiser Permanente to start administering these questionnaires and asking people how much abuse you experienced. And, if you can imagine, they got some pushback from the, from the doctors saying, we can't do this. This is going to open Pandora's box. We don't, we're not equipped to be able to, to deal with, with all of the, the floodgate that's going to open if we start asking people in our clinics if they were sexually abused, physically abused, experienced domestic violence, alcohol in the family. So, so uh, they said, okay, well, here's what we'll do. Um, to address any of those needs that happen, we're going to set up a hotline, like a 1-800 number, and if anyone feels really distressed because you ask them these questions, they can call this number and they'll immediately get connected with mental health services. We'll be right there to, to help help them out. So the doctors breathed a little sigh of relief and said, okay, we think we can do this. So they, they started doing this with that 1-800 number up there. Uh, anyone guess how many calls that hotline got? You would think a lot, the answer, zero. As a matter of fact, something different started happening. What they noticed was they, that they were getting fewer visits to the emergency room and fewer instances of, of illnesses just by people being asked these questions. Their physical health was, was somehow improving just by someone knowing their story. Right, that there were there were fewer uh, illnesses that were being reported, and so and then doctors started getting letters from the people, their patients, that they'd asked these these questions to, thanking them for asking them the questions. One of them, Dr. Felitti, in one of his his t uh, talks that he gave, he had the letter of this lady that was in her 90s, that uh, wrote this handwritten letter to her doctor, saying, "I'm I'm in my 90s." And, and doctor, thank you for asking me these questions. I thought I was gonna go to my grave and no one was going to know my story. So that power of being known, even just from a doctor asking you, hey, have you experienced these things? There was something that had happened there, connection-wise, health-wise, things, things started getting better for folks. So, um, so knowing about this, even having someone know your story is powerful, and, it's, and there's some, some healing aspects to it. But they, they started talking, Dr. Felitti and the, the, um, the, the director of the CDC, the Center for Disease Control at that time, and, and he said, Dr. Felitti, this is true that this many people, if this generalizes to, to the like American population, we are sitting on a healthcare epidemic. This is a crisis that we're sitting on. And it's trauma. That trauma is driving the, the national cost of healthcare, our overall wellness, our overall health as a nation is, is driving it down because of, of these traumatic effects. So what, what do we do about this? Is there anything we can do? So the first thing is, let's roll it out. Let's get it out there. Let's get the information out there. And the next thing, one of the first things he said was, what will help this epidemic is parent training. Greater insight for parents. 
parents who understand how impactful trauma is, who can prevent it and have some skills and some strategies in place to do what needs to be done for kids to be raised in, in healthy households so that we lower those, those ACEs scores. So congratulations, just by being here tonight, you're helping with a global health epidemic. We're helping get awareness, get, get more skills. So we're gonna get some more skills. We're gonna improve our insight even more. What, what I'm gonna do for this next little section here is, uh, is get super, super trauma informed. And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the mental health side of trauma. Things you might be able to expect some symptoms that when you start noticing these things, you can say, aha, this is more than likely trauma related. I can't tell you how many people would, would come into my office uh, for our, our intakes and, and they had brand, you know, new, new kids in the household, new foster kids, and they would talk about all these behaviors that just looked so baffling. It's like, I don't know what this is. I don't understand why they're doing this. And it's like, it's, here it is. This is, this is related to post-traumatic stress disorder. This is related to attachment disorders um, and being able to kind of at least put some explanation behind what's going on. So we're just going to go through uh, for a little bit here some, some symptoms associated with trauma. And just a little caveat here, if a kiddo has you know, a couple of the, one of these or a couple of these, it doesn't always mean they have post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, sometimes kids experience significant traumas and don't even meet full criteria for PTSD. There's something about their grit and their resilience that helps them kind of remain strong. Other kids, um, you, you see a lot more of these sorts of things. So um, just, just kind of as a warning, don't use this as like a diagnostic tool, but think about um, these are some symptoms that are related to, to trauma. So the first one is uh, re-experiencing the trauma. So this has to do with nightmares, intrusive recollections, flashbacks, and even traumatic play. So kids who do the, you know, the crash up, bang up, violent sorts of play, sometimes that is their way of, of kind of re-experiencing and having some sort of control over the trauma. If that's something that's really disturbing to you, um, I would recommend getting them into some good, some play therapy. Something where they can have a good space with, with someone who's trained to be able to kind of help them work through some of that. Or if you want to do some training yourself on filial play therapy and learning how to, to kind of handle some of that space where kids can do uh, some of the, that play that they need to do. But the nightmares, they don't have to be even associated with the trauma. It's not like they have to dream about the incident. Even like scary nightmares, monsters being chased, drowning, falling, a lot of those sorts of things are, are kind of trauma related sorts of, of dreams. Intrusive recollections, that's the memories that come in your brain you don't really want to be thinking about them, they just kind of float in. Avoidance of trauma triggers. So uh, memories, situations, that remind the child of the traumatic event. If they are really averse to certain things, pay attention to that. Doesn't always mean trauma, but it might. Um, so if you have a kid who's really resistant to certain, to certain things, um, that may be something that, that you need to pay attention to. Places people, things, times of day. Oh my goodness, uh, the holidays sometimes are a extremely triggering time for kids. Think, I mean, think about um, how many sights, sounds, and smells there are connected with Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, I mean, all those sorts of things. And if, and remember when the, the lid flips and you're just soaking in all the sensory, all of that stuff may get kind of lodged in, in the body. So um, being really sensitive, especially around holidays, um, can, can be important. Um, but it, it recognize if they're, if they're averse to certain things. Exaggerated negative beliefs about oneself and the world arising from the event. I'm no good. These people are no good. You can't trust adults. You can't trust. I can't trust myself. Um, persistent negative emotional state, irritability. Um, inability to experience positive emotions. It's a symptom of, of trauma. Um, kind of that irritable, cranky, um, bad mood, irritable, um, ne negative thoughts, difficulty even engaging in the good stuff of life. It's like, hey, we're, we're at the park. Hey, we're at the you know, Disneyland. We're at the playground. We're, and, and they're just kind of not in it. it it's, it's symptomatic. Feelings of detachment from people. I just feel kind of disconnected from, from people around me. 
Um, loss of interest in participation of significant activities. They stop wanting to play basketball. They stop wanting to go swimming. They stop wanting so. So being able to recognize um, they used to like this a lot, now they don't like it so much. Uh, inability to remember part of the traumatic event. This has to do sometimes with how deep they are in that downstairs brain. Sometimes they're not even processing, definitely not processing like linear memories or logical memories. Sometimes it's, it's sensory, so they can't even like make sense. They can't even all the time tell all, all the parts of the story because of how their brain processed it. Um, sleep problems. Well, in sleep problems, I'm going to say a few things on that. One is um, even just bedtime in general for a kid who's experienced trauma can be really difficult. It's when all the distractions of life kind of stop, everything starts to get very quiet very still, lights go down, that's ripe, the brain is ripe for kind of those intrusive memories, those, those hard things that kind of flood, flood the memory. So, so being sensitive, if your kiddos are, you know, bedtime is just super, super rough, um, it could be that that's, that may be what's, what's going on for them. But also just the ability to, to stay asleep, nightmares, sometimes kids get so triggered by the nightmares they don't even want to go to sleep at, at all. And sometimes the brain's so active that it's tough to get those deep REM uh, sleep cycles. Irritability, uh, reckless or destructive behavior, destroying things, uh, being very impulsive, reckless, kind of that loss of, of executive functioning, right? I'm not thinking about the consequences because um, I'm kind of feeling pretty triggered. Hy hypervigilance, this is the, the kids who are scanning the environment always. Where are the exits? What's, what's going on? Um, who's walking in the room right now? What do they look like? What's going on in their face? They're constantly vigilant about the world around them. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, these a lot of kids that I work with who've experienced trauma, they're the ones that recognize, you're wearing different shoes than you've ever worn today, Corey. Or you got your hair cut. I, I, one, one of the kids noticed I got my hair cut before my wife even recognized it. Because they just, they pay attention to the details. Their brain is hypersensitive to change. Change can mean threat. Change can mean things are going to get bad for you. So their brain gets very sensitive to those changes. Yeah. Real quick, um, that some of these things don't necessarily mean that there is trauma. Right. Ab absolutely. Like if somebody is really, really... Um, hypervigilant, it could just be that they have a chemical thing, or I don't know. Sure. So the question was, um, one of these things doesn't always mean trauma, and yes, ab absolutely doesn't always mean that. But if you start seeing clusters of things, if you start seeing a lot of these, and especially if you know that there's been trauma, this is more that explanation guides your intervention. You can explain what's going on. Exaggerated startle response, loud noises, crashes, cha quick changes, even quick movements. Even as we were, we were training our, our child care staff that were going to be at all the sites, we were talking about being really careful about making quick and sudden movements around kids who've experienced trauma. Be, be careful about those. Even announce, hey, I'm going to walk over here and I'm going to see what's going on over here, just so you can kind of make the environment a little bit more predictable. Uh, concentration problems, difficulty focusing. A lot of times kids who've experienced trauma get misdiagnosed as ADHD. They have difficulty focusing, difficulty paying attention. They can't do their math because they're stuck in their trauma. Again, think about doing seat work for kids in school. That is a prime time for those memories to come back when the whole class is being quiet. Teacher's not talking anymore. So it's like, well, little Johnny just can't focus on his math work. He just can't read. Um, let's, let's get him on some stimulants here. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with stimulants or legitimate ADHD, but you get a kiddo who's experienced trauma. Their brain is anxious. They have a, you know, a sensory thing going on, and you pour stimulant on top of that, and it could be a recipe for, for disaster. A kid who's already anxious now amped up. So this is why it's super important when doing assessments. When I was doing mental health assessments most of the time, and, and there was ever a question of focus and attention, I always wanted to drill down, is there trauma? Is there something going on here that could be masking as ADHD? Now, sometimes there's both. Sometimes there's, there's, there's trauma that, that a kid's experienced, and they have a legitimate neurologically-based ADHD, 
it gets very tricky at that point. So it does happen sometimes, but it's important to tease apart here what's what, what's, what's going on here. All right, so that's kind of the, the post-traumatic stress disorder side of things. And they've actually, in DSM-5, they have that kind of carved out for kids differently than they do adults, which is fabulous. They're able to, to see this, this looks a little bit different in kids than it does like an adult veteran population. Right, that they, they look a little different, so I'm, I'm glad that there's, there's some language changes and some things that make it a little bit easier to, to diagnose. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at here is, is um, attachment disorders. So we're going to look at kind of the two sides of this. The, we're going to look at the inhibited type or the reactive. These are the kids who react poorly to coming together with relationship. Right? Things have happened. There's been relational trauma. And coming together, coming close to someone is triggering to the point that you see behavioral issues pop up. Things like a child who will rarely or minimally seek comfort when distressed. These are diagnostic features in the diagnostic manual. So kids will resist comfort when distressed. A child who rarely or minimally responds to comfort when distressed. So you go to comfort them and you might get pushed away you might even get some, some, uh, some choice words or some even the behavior escalate when you try to do the comfort. This is, this is a diagnostic feature, guys. So this is one of those things where you have to kind of go to your place of security. When you're going and doing the, the right thing and you're, and you're trying to care for that kid and you get totally the opposite response, it's important. To, again, explanation guides your intervention. It's not that you're a bad parent. You're doing what's instinctual. You're doing what feels right. This may be a symptom of, of an, an attachment um, disorder that's going on for the kiddo. Minimal social uh, and emotional response to others. They don't um, respond very well so in social situations. They kind of tend to be to themselves. Um, you see the avoidant attachment style in here a lot, and especially kind of that, that uh, push-pull of the fearful disorganized. Um, episodes of unexplained irritability, sadness, or tearfulness. Mood stuff. They look depressed. They look angry. They look irritable. They look cranky. Um, limited expressions of positive affect or joy. The face was just kind of blank a lot of the time. The difficulty making that smile muscle work, right? These are the kids when you do their star breathing, you have to tell them it's not going to work just trying to make your mouth, you got to push. <laughs> Get that smile to do that, that smile, take a breath and relax thing. Because um, you just don't see a whole lot of, of joy. So that's kind of the, the push side of, of attachment disorders. And then there's a pull side as well. This is the, the disinhibited type. So the inhibitions are gone, right? The other side, there's a lot of, of inhibitions. They are inhibited. They With these kiddos, there are, there are just no inhibitions. You may have seen this before. So lack of reticence in approaching and interacting with unfamiliar adults. They don't know you yet, and they, they just run right up to you like they're, you're their best friend. Um, so even things like overly f uh, familiar verbal or physical behaviors, hugging strangers, sitting on the laps of unfamiliar adults. That kind of natural, you're my person who I know, and you're a stranger, that that's been messed with due to the attachment problems that have happened. Overly familiar, that, that risk. Can you see how kids in this category could be really, really high risk to be perpetrated again and again and again, right? These kiddos can become targets for, for predators because of some of this lack of inhibition sometimes. So knowing this is super, super important. Uh, willingness, to, willingness to approach a complete stranger for comfort, food, or to be picked up, or to receive a toy. Uh, diminished or absent checking back with adult caretaker when in unfamiliar situations. So this is, so they, th this is when they don't go back to home base, right? They go to the park and they're just kind of gone. And you have to be the one who goes and checks on them rather than them coming to check back with you. So um, knowing that is, is important. So this is, this is from the folks at, at TCU. They put this on. This is, um, 
the ones who do trust-based relational interventions. So uh, we're gonna look a little bit more at what the experts have to say about brain development and trauma here. As recently as the 1980s, scientists believed a child's brain at birth was fairly static, largely predetermined by genetics. Researchers now know that's not true. While genetics clearly play a role, scientists know that relationships and experiences shape the brain. Think of a developing brain like a multi-storied house under construction. In this chapter, we'll explore the basics of brain development and help you understand how early traumatic experiences can design a different house. When we're born, our brains are teeming with more than 100 billion neurons or brain cells. Under optimal conditions, when our needs are met consistently by nurturing caregivers, we got a red ball. our brains thrive. These neurons connect in complex and vast networks, much like the electrical wiring in a modern home. The baby comes with all this wiring, but it's the human interaction, looking into the eyes, being held, hearing the song of my mother, feeling the strong shoulder of my daddy, that begin to make the brain develop in very, very important ways for all of the life skills that will come. At birth, the lower floors, or the downstairs part of the brain, is firmly wired in place by genetics, allowing a child to breathe, eat, sleep, and hear. Survival functions are rooted here. Very few connections in the upper floors are formed. These more sophisticated parts of the brain govern higher functions, complex thought, reasoning, emotional processing, memory, speech, and most importantly, the ability to regulate our behavior. It takes time and repeated experiences for this circuitry to develop and become hardwired in the brain. When a child experiences trauma, abuse, neglect, or other risk factors, it can skew the wiring of the brain, as well as the structure and the chemistry. The lower, more primitive survival part of the brain can overdevelop from reacting to fear, while the critical upper floors may underdevelop and suffer. In the book that I wrote with Dan Siegel, The Whole Brain Child, we talk about an upstairs brain and a downstairs brain. For some kids... Dr. Bryson is a psychotherapist at Pediatric and Adolescent Psychology Associates, Director of Parenting Education for the Mindsight Institute in California, and best-selling author along with Mindsight Executive Director, Dr. Dan Siegel. The upstairs brain is the more sophisticated part of the brain. It's our cortex that takes a long, long time to develop. And it's the part of the brain that allows us to regulate our emotions and calm down our bodies, understand ourselves, understand other people, and really be able to make good choices and be flexible and adaptive. The downstairs brain is much more primitive. It's actually really well developed at birth. And it's the limbic area and the brain stem connected to the body. And that part of the brain is much more reactive. And its job is to kind of constantly be watching for how to keep us alive. Dr. Bryson's research and studies in attachment science, child rearing theory, and interpersonal neurobiology have made her a sought after expert contributor with appearances on Good Morning America, PBS, and Red Book Magazine. She says trauma triggers the watchdog part of the lower brain, called the amygdala, to work overtime. And its job is to constantly sort of scan the environment, to be paranoid a little bit, to be watching, is, is everything okay here? Am I okay? Am I safe? Is anyone out to get me? Can I relax? And that part of the brain is always appraising what's going on around us, reading faces, reading the environment. Do you like bubblegum? Yeah. No. When children feel threatened or overwhelmed with fear, they may fight, run away, or shut down. The brain kicks into survival response, which researchers called fight, flight, or freeze survival mode. If the brain stays in this state too long because of trauma, it reorganizes around survival at the expense of healthy development of other parts of the brain. So for a child who's had repeated exposure to fearful experiences. 
whether those be sort of a trauma like a car accident, or whether it's developmental or relational trauma, where the caregiver was frightening, or they were left for long periods of time to manage their own fear states. The downstairs brain has gotten a lot of practice being active. It's the repeated experiences that we have that actually activate growth and connection in the brain. So if a child has had a lot of experiences where their downstairs brain that was reactive and fearful, that part of the brain gets really well developed. Whereas then the upstairs brain that knows how to calm that fear and kind of do that self-soothing like, oh, that was a scary noise, but I'm okay now. That part of the brain may not be as well developed in children who have had repeated fearful experiences. So kind of getting the, getting the score here, right? The stuff matters, the things that have happened in the past impact brain development, they impact our, our physical health, our emotional health, our behavioral health, all of those sorts of things. So um, for the last part of what we have tonight, I wanna really look at what's next, what do we do to, to help out with this. So we're gonna watch one little clip here from, from a lot of experts. You'll see Dr. Dan Siegel and Bruce Perry talking on this about what can we do as insightful people to help? What, how do we help, well, make, help make this better? Early childhood trauma changes the biology of the brain. Well, early childhood support also changes the biology of the brain. What studies of resilience show that even when children have insecure attachments in the home, if they've had at least one secure attachment with a daycare provider, a preschool teacher, or another adult in their lives, then that makes a huge difference for them having the seed of resilience they may still have difficulties, but because they've had that one secure relationship, that relationship where they felt that another individual, the another adult knows them, and feels what's going on inside of them, those kids have the potential to do very well in the future. We can see imaging today uh, of before and after trauma and see what happens in the brain. And we can also see repair that happens in the brain when our interventions have been successful. What makes children get better following a trauma is connection to other human beings. Human beings who are present, who are patient, who are kind, who are sensitive. And they, they don't need to be necessarily psychologically insightful. They don't need to know anything about trauma. All they need to know, know is that they're right there with this child. They're trying to be comforting. They're trying to be supportive. They're trying to encourage. Those kinds of interactions end up being much more therapeutic and healing than many of the other things that we try to do with kids. Teachers can look more at their children, be more emotionally present for children, touch them, uh, work on their own nervous system and their own regulation. If they're angry and they're uh, out of control in terms of what's going on inside of themselves, the message that they're going to convey to the child is, I'm angry and I don't like you. If you're an adult, and there are children in your life, whether you're in law enforcement, a teacher, a parent, a foster parent, whatever you are, and you know that a child has been exposed to something that's potentially traumatic, uh, the first thing that you should be aware of is that not all traumatic events lead to disastrous mental health outcomes. In fact, the vast majority of children that are traumatized actually do pretty well, but they do need your attention, they do need your kind support, and they do need your awareness about what are warning signs that would tell you to actually take the next step and try to get some professional help. It's up to us. We can't wait for a they to do this spreading of the message that we can do something about it, that children, especially young children, have the most possibility for health and plasticity, for overcoming these early traumas if we as a community, a large community, support them. We have permission now to meet children's needs. We have permission now from neuroscience to give children what they need. And to me, that is so exciting. If there was one place I would like to start with individuals as well as our society trying to make a difference, to, to really stop the cross-generational passage of trauma and of insecure attachment. It would be for parents to start a process of self-understanding. 
it basically costs nothing except the time and emotion that it takes for parents to begin on that process. And we all can do it. And the people who benefit most besides ourselves are our children. We're spending literally 95% of our public dollars to change the brain because that's what mental health is. That's what public education is. That's what juvenile justice intervention is. All of these are trying to change the brain. And we're spending almost nothing in the first five years of life when the brain is easiest to modify. And it takes the least amount of professional input, the least amount of insight. It takes just high quality caregiving. It's us, not they. It's, it's each one of us doing it now, not later, but now. To get you fired up, it does me. I love, so Dan Siegel, his, how many people does it take to change the course of this? Just one. I mean, you could be the one person that turns the tide of a child's entire health, mental health, physical health, change the ACEs story for your kiddos. What I'd like for you to do is do a little bit of self-assessment, you being the person who interacts with your kiddo. Um, on page 35, there's a little list here from the neurosequential model. Um, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to get in groups. I want you to do this kind of on your own for just a second here. Just take a minute and, and, take, and do a little evaluation of how are you doing right now? What are you good at? Assess what your strengths are. So what I want you to do is uh, underline any areas that are strengths for you and your current parent strategies, some things that you feel. And, and then I want you to circle any areas you feel like you could grow in a little bit more. All right, so just take a look at that list. There's, there's just a handful of things there on page 35. Underline your strengths, circle areas for growth. And then what I'd like for you to do is maybe write down one goal. Something that in those areas of growth that you would like to get a little bit better at. What's an action step? What's a plan you can do to, to get better at that? So take a minute. And I want to give you a few more nuggets here, things of, of that, some action steps to do. We're going to um, kind of wrap up our time here looking at uh, the trust-based interventions model. We're going to go deeper into this in a few weeks, but I don't want to leave this week with just, hey, here's the trauma, here's the problem, without a few more action steps, some things that you can actually practice this week. So as, as you're watching this, be thinking about any of, these, any of these ideas, steps, strategies, thoughts, how these explanations can guide your interventions with your kiddos. And uh, for, for this week's action steps, it's gonna be kind of based on, on this video. So think about what are some things you can do um, based, based on what you see here. TBRI, Trust-Based Relational Intervention, has at its core building a trusting relationship. It has three sets of principles, and they look at the child as a whole. When you think about development, the baby cries, and I say, yes, I will comfort you. And so this child learns that they have a voice. They learn trust, which is the lesson of the first year of life. I can trust. There are so many children from hard places, and for those children, their capacity to trust has been fiercely damaged. The brain chemistry of a child who cries and no one comes is dramatically altered. The child with a history of trauma or loss or abuse has no hope of healing without a nurturing relationship. In every way that I make time and space, that I give touch, eye contact, and I give words, I am going to empower this child to go back to the beginning of what he or she should have experienced in the arms of a loving parent that said, when you cry, I will come. The phenomenal thing about a trust-based intervention is, as we connect to this child, as we build safety, we actually change the brain chemistry. We change the wiring of the brain. This is really the heart and soul of all that we are and all that we do. Do I look into the child's eyes? Do I touch their arm when I talk to them? When they talk to me, do I stop what I'm doing and talk to them? This is the essence of mindfulness. The excitatory chemicals about, I'm afraid, I'm hungry, I'm cold, those are balanced when the caregiver comes and gives warmth. All regulation occurs first with an external regulator. So in the beginning, I regulate all. They're cold, I bring warmth. They're crying, I bring myself. And out of my regulation, their brain develops capacity for self-regulation. If this child didn't have this experience, that child doesn't feel safe. This chemistry can be altered 
First, by knowing they're safe. Second, by nutrient-rich foods. Third, by my environmental regulation of that child's emotion. And fourth, by appropriate exercise. So we can balance brain chemistry by creating a holistic environment. We clearly have to deal with behavior. Correcting means showing a child the right behavior, praising him when he gets it, and showing it to him until he can get it right, and showing him with no fear and no shame so that he builds success, not a greater sense of failure. So the message of hope for our families is that we can help our children to dramatic levels of healing. We simply have to be devoted to it and be willing to invest what it's going to take. All right. So here we have it. You see the full spectrum here. You see how it impacts the brain, behavior, functioning. And we've got some things that we can try now, some things to, to, to uh, work on over this week. So on page 36, this is your action steps for this week. Um, I want you to set some goals and even maybe even jot down how it's worked out for you this, this coming week. Um, set some goals around empowerment. What are some things you can do to empower a kid, help a kid who has not been able to make choices or has had to make too many choices, have that healthy balance of, of power within the relationship, shared power together. Um, some, some ways you can work on connection with your child. What can you do? Can, can you use some of the things that we know about the brain, about how they're behaving, to, to really connect with that child and, and some correction. When things aren't going well, what can you do to, to help things get on track? I love how she mentioned without fear and without shame. Right? We're not doing shame, we're empowering to do the right thing and sometimes that takes some role modeling on, on our part to, to get them there. Ooh, manipulation, anyone wanna learn about manipulation? We'll do that one in a few weeks. We'll come back to that just to keep you going. So I want to finish here with, with a quote from Dr. Bruce Perry. So I, lo I love this. The more healthy relationships a child has, the more likely he will be to recover from trauma and thrive. Relationships are the agent of change, and the most powerful therapy is, is human love. You could be that one person that is therapeutic in the relationship to change the absolute wiring in the brain for a child to change the brain chemistry. And, and you see this happen, I've seen it happen so many times where it's not even in my office where I get to see the kid for an hour a week. It's in your homes where, where this happens. That healing quality of relationship where you understand their world, you understand yourself, and you're able to interact with them in a way that's secure and that's present that's not blaming and that's not shaming, but is absolutely meeting the child on their level. And it may not be their, their chronological age. You know, Karen Purvis that came up with that, that TBRI model says that a lot of times kiddos are like sometimes half of their chronological age when they've experienced abuse or neglect or trauma. So, so meeting the kid where they are what their emotional age is, not their chronological age is. Where their brain is developed, not where it should have developed. Catering everything to the specific needs of, of that kiddo so that they feel known and they feel understood. Relationship, is the, it's the healing factor. It's what makes things better for, for these kiddos. So uh, just to the, the summary here, be, be aware of the signs of trauma, respond from a place of understanding. Know the signs, know the symptoms, be a good detective about what's going on and what it may be coming from. Uh, Dan Siegel has this dog bite analogy. He says that a lot of times when, when a, you know, a dog has bitten your hand, the tendency is to pull away. And with our kiddos, if, we, if, if they start engaging with us and they start re revealing some of their trauma and we pull away, it does damage to us and to them. And his analogy is a little bit gross, but he says that, you know, if a dog bites your hand, push your fist further into the dog's mouth. And they, and they gag and they let you go. But with our kiddos, sometimes we have to go into the mouth of the trauma. Be present with them. Be, be engaged. Don't, don't uh, yank back, but be, be there. Be away. Be with them. And one positive attachment can be enough to change the course of brain development. 
leads a child down a new path of resilience. They've got a new story, a new way of doing a relationship. And try using these trust-based interventions. Do the connection, do the, the uh, engagement, correct. Try some of the other things, engage, don't enrage, connect to redirect, name it to tame it. Uh, give this stuff some, some, uh, some tries. See what it looks like, and I would love to hear stories uh, from you guys. I'd love to, to hear some next week. If you want to send them through the emails, you can just respond to my weekly emails with, with your examples, with your stories. I'd love to hear them or bring them here to see how it works. Some great successes, but also some, some wonderful failures we can learn from, too, can, can be great. So have an excellent week. Hope to see you back next week, and we'll start looking at some how to do some problem solving, step-by-step -step problem solving with our kids kids um, for, for some good connection and interaction. Have a wonderful week. See you next time.